And um, just to remind people that then we're being broadcast through the uh, Assembly's systems. Um, we are on item two, which is the legal advice on a potential committee inquiry. We have received the legal advice from legal services and it is quite conclusive that it is not our role as a committee to undertake such an inquiry. I will invite any comments from members at this stage, if there are any. I think it's conclusive. Okay. And then pursuant to that, is there any elements that people wish to raise? Okay, that's great. So we can move on then to item three, which is the draft minutes. Um, uh, just the members, the meeting was held on the 8th of July was our last meeting and the minutes are on page seven of the meeting pack. Members content that the minutes are a true reflection of the proceedings of the meeting? Yep. Um, okay, then item, item four is matters arising. I don't have any matters arising. Do members have any matters arising? No, sir. Okay. Okay, well then that allows us then to move on to uh, section five, which is the Brexit oral evidence from departmental officials. The papers of which are on pages 13 to 83 of the meeting pack. Uh, there is a memo from the EU Affairs Manager at page 80 of the pack, and it includes a copy of co correspondence from Jeremy Miles, Council General and Minister for European Transition in the Welsh Government, to David Rees, who is the Chair of the Welsh Parliament's External Affairs and Additional Legislation. The correspondence um, details the 10 priority common frameworks that have been identified for the delivery of Brexit. These are the frameworks the junior ministers referred to at the meeting on the 24th of June, uh, but we are yet to receive notification from the executive office. So we're getting our information from the uh, Welsh uh, Parliament to provide us with the information that we uh, are needing to scrutinise as we're not getting it from uh, the executive office. Um, can I get agreement to forward a copy of the correspondence to the relevant committees to which the framework referred? Um, essentially, the framework make, makes references to several areas which would be of note to committees here within the Assembly. Uh, and as I say, we're not getting that from the Department, but maybe we should uh, take the opportunity to inform the committees of issues that might be of relevance to them. Members be content with that? Bertina? Uh, yes, content with that, but uh, I think we would also get an opportunity today to talk to officials around the common framework and we might get more information than what we currently have. Okay, Hopefully. so we can send the information that we have and then potentially uh, there may be some... Can we send the hands out of this session to the other committees as well? Is that something that's that, available? Yeah. When it's available and that might provide some more clarity for those as well. Um, okay, so departmental officials are in attendance today to brief us on the most recent developments in relation to Brexit, including progress made at the second stage of the specialised committee of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol, which took place on the 16th of July. Uh, Andrew McCormick attended the specialised committee on behalf of the Northern Ireland Executive. Uh, so I take the opportunity now to welcome Andrew to the meeting today, along with Lindsay Moore, um, who is director of the European Division and head of the office. Uh, of the Northern Ireland Executive in Brussels. It's good to see you in person. We've, we've spoken a number of times we on have. phones, but you're very welcome. It's good to see you both. And we also have, uh, hopefully via, yep, we do, we have via telephone Lorraine Linus, who is the Deputy Director of the EU Future Relations in the Executive Office. So we're going to maybe present our pass over to yourselves just to present a few uh, updates to us based on that, and then we'll move into a question and answer session. And just as ever, it's been recorded and hand sorted or taken notes as well. So, Andrew, we'll pass over to yourself. Good to see you again, and we'll let you do your presentation. Thanks, Ross and Chair, and, and uh, good to be here in person. Thanks for the chance to, to do this again. Uh, and uh, we'll try and, try and cover some of the things you've mentioned. Uh, thankfully, Lorraine is our, our expert on common frameworks, so we can bring her in when, when you want to. Uh, deal with that as, as well as some of the other things that uh, she works with me on and they, uh, covers the um, Brussels angle a lot, uh, mainly but, but it happens to be here at the moment. Uh, so the specialised committee, uh, um, of course the treaty makes its, its um, proceedings confidential so uh, I, 
therefore, I'm, I'm, there's limits on what I can say. Uh, on the other hand, the, the, the areas of interest uh, and the points that are evolving at the present time are, are pretty well known, and uh, so there's, there's no, difficult, no difficulty c covering what are the uh, topics of, of concern at the present time and the way it's all moving forward. Uh, I'm going to pause you there as you got the a sense. I'm, I'm conscious the people that are on. Uh, can I just check that our members are still online because we can't see them? Maybe check with Emma. Emma, are you there? Okay. Yeah, okay. You're still seeing proceedings? Can you okay? hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. That's okay. Can no, you hear us? Just appeared there. I don't know what happened. Um, it might be a case that we may lose the visual feed, but I think we can. you'll be able to hear us. It's just that you fell off our screen there, all members did. So um, I'm just conscious that as long as you're there. But if we've got you, George, was there? George, are you still there? Yes, you are indeed. Okay, that's fine. So we, we may lose the visual link, but the members are still able to, to hear the presentation. Oh, no. So we, Inter we'll go back to yourself. Interrupt me if you need to, obviously, Chair, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep going unless you tell me not to. Uh, so a specialised committee, um, it, its its role is to provide uh, a forum for discussion of, of the issues that, that then need to be taken to the joint committee for decision. So that, that's the, the fundamental nature of the role, uh, and it brings together uh, the the, uh, no, the negotiating leads would be Cabinet Office Transition Task Force and uh, the UK Task Force in the Commission, but uh, there was also attendance, and there would, would re regularly be attendance by a range of officials from Whitehall, uh, the, the lead departments that are involved in the, in the topics under consideration, and then some of the main directorates general in the Commission, uh, and then some of the member states uh, under New Decade, New Approach, uh, the undertaking was that if, if Irish government officials are there, then uh, the executive would be invited, and, and that's been faithfully held to. Uh, of course, given given the topic and, and the range of coverage, it's of great interest. I mean, this is this is all very central, a very central set of issues for consideration. Uh, so uh, I've been there at the, the two meetings now, and there'll be a further further meeting, uh, I think, early in the autumn, because there's now. A lot of things that need to actually go forward to the joint committee for decision making, uh, and, and again, drawing as much on our our ongoing engagement with the businesses as well as the specific deliberations in Brussels, uh, just to give you give the, the, the a summary of the main issues that are under consideration. So, um, we're looking at uh, implementation of the protocol. So, uh, the Commission, after the previous specialised committee, got a, got a technical note, and they were saying. We need to move into full-scale implementation, and they wanted to, to, do, to do that. I think the reality remains that there are quite a few things that need to be decided. So implementation, implementation and decision-making are moving on echelon, so to speak. You know, there, 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 there's some things we can get, get on and do, and which can be done by DERA in, in the important work they're doing, uh, and by the relevant Whitehall departments in, in implementing various aspects of the protocol, while still taking step by step and a step by step approach to resolving some of the, the things that need to be sorted out uh, so that that's a very tight timetable it's just a fact as a matter of fact of course this all has to be in place and operational uh, for the end of the year given the uh, clear decisions uh, not to extend transition so that, that's that's where we are uh, so broad headings then would be mainstream implementation of the issues that are there and you only have to work through the, the topics in the protocol to see where those are. Uh, a big and important one will be on um, agri-food checks on goods moving from GB to NI. That's probably a central and, and, and challenging topic, uh, and that was covered in, in, in all our discussions. There, so there were, were a range of um, technical meetings happening in the same week as the, as the specialised committee, uh, going into more detail, and again, we've had some some good feedback as to progress going on on that. So I can give you, give you a broad impression of the, the state of play. Uh, so commitment and progress, UK government very, very clear that, that the, uh, there will be full implementation, um, that there's, there's no renegotiation of the protocol. Uh, it's, it's a matter of, of interpretation, mitigation, uh, and looking at ways to make sure, as everyone says, I think, I think and this is said by all ministers and UK ministers and uh, executive ministers would be saying the same broad point here. 
We want to get to a place where protocol is implemented in a way that causes a minimum disruption to the movement of goods in all directions. Uh, NITGB is predominantly a matter for the UK. Uh, there is the, uh, the issue of exit declarations, which in the command paper the UK said shouldn't be needed, uh, but the, the command paper obviously acknowledges that that's an issue for, for further discussion and decision. It, it's, it's, not, it's not not a unilateral action. Uh, what they're saying is it's not, there's no reason for them, and th therefore they hope to persuade the Commission to accept that, but that's still to be to play for. It still has to be resolved, uh, and that, that's, that's, that's one of the main issues. Uh, it's the only real impediment in, re in relation to the movement of goods NITGB, the only extra bureaucracy. Uh, in the other direction, obviously, that's um, much more complicated. Uh, the command paper draws out clearly uh, no new customs infrastructure. They, 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 there is a customs declaration obligation, so everything has to be identified uh, in documentation, but electronically. So that's the intent and ambition is to have that system fully in place and operational for the end of the year. Again, that's ambitious, but it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the commitment they're making that there's... Uh, that, that should streamline the movement of goods, GB to NI, and far as, as far as customs is concerned. The question then will be, uh, I'll come into this in the second part of the, of the, 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 the range of issues, into the question of at-risk goods. Let's, I'll come back to that shortly. Staying with the, main, the mainstream implementation, uh, then it's, it's uh, ensuring that the agri-food checks are there. Th those exist uh, to fulfill, uh, as, as the UK government said in the command paper, uh, recognising the island as a single epidemiological unit and therefore reasonable to, to build on the existing range of checks that preserve animal health, plant health and human health. That's a that's, uh, that highly, highly sensitive issue, um, but one where practical steps are being taken and it's being explored in a way with the objective of minimising the, the friction that will arise. So that, that's, that's work in progress and one where as uh, you know, as the Commission said after the Specialised Committee, they're, they're uh, wanting to see progress and the UK Government saying in their, their communications committed to making that progress and to delivering uh, all uh, that is essential to deliver uh, and assure all concerned that that's, that's, that's happening. There are a number of other articles in the protocol where detail is needed. Uh, so the VAT treatment, uh, that, that's probably one that requires quite a lot of extra work at the present time to, 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 get, to get to a place where there can be clarity uh, for businesses and that, that's, that's the goal everyone's working towards and trying to get to as quickly as possible, uh, recognising the reality that some things still need to be resolved and discussed. So, that, so VAT would be high on that list uh, as, as one that needs um, particular attention. Uh, there's good progress on a range of issues in relation to manufactured goods. So there's, there's, there's progress being made in relation to all of those things. That's the general implementation of the protocol. Uh, alongside that, then, there are four specific areas where the Joint Committee is required to take decisions, uh, and these are areas that need to be specifically resolved. Uh, and I, all, I think all I can say at this stage is that, is that there is detailed work going on at technical level on each of these four issues, progress being made, none, none of them finally resolved. They, they all will need to come formally to the Joint Committee. The Specialised Committee will need to uh, <coughs> bring together the views and bring together the, the different uh, considerations that affect the decisions on those four items. The four items are the definition of address goods. So uh, if the, pr the protocol says that the, there are no tariffs payable on entry into Northern Ireland for goods that are not at risk of entering the single market. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the aim would be to ensure that definition is as broad as possible, that that would, would minimise the friction. Um, but you can see the, the inherent logic in it, in that uh, if, there are, if there are goods being processed here and being sold on into the single market, that's, that's a, it's a, a legitimate consideration in looking at, at how the single market works, but, but one where the commitment has to be to minimise the implications. So that's that's technical. Uh, we require some de detailed definitions. And as business representatives have said, both publicly and in their engagement with the government, there's lots of, of different issues to analyse on that front, because you know different 
uh, sectors of the economy have different considerations. It's the, it's the nature of supply chains, the fact that there are, you know, wh while uh, during membership, uh, when both Ireland and the UK were, were, were full members of the EU, so supply chains evolved in a way that, that uh, you know, the behaviour was a, a, in a single market. So that's, that's totally understandable and uh, has been economically advantageous. Now we've got to, got to look at, at how to work that out in a way that is maintaining as much economic advantage as possible. So um, address goods is number one. Uh, second one is to do with uh, the level of subsidy payable to agriculture and fisheries in Northern Ireland within state aid limits. Again, this is again avoiding a distortion of trade, and that's the technical point uh, as to what financial regime would follow on from um, um, the fact that we're no longer in, in CAP and so on. Third topic is, for, is a specialist in relation to fisheries landings and how um, when Northern Ireland fisheries bring uh, produce back, in, back here on their land, when what, what, what rules apply? How does, that, how does the inter interaction between Northern Ireland as part of the UK customs territory and yet under single market rules, how does that work again in terms of, of duties? So that's uh, again quite technical, quite specialist. Probably a bit of a ten tension and link there with one of the biggest difficulties in the main talks uh, between Messrs. Uh, Frost and Barnier in relation to fisheries. Fisheries it stands out as one of the most difficult issues there. Uh, I think it, from our point of view, better to keep those as separate as possible because uh, this is a, a, a small technical point, but highly sensitive, of course, for um, the fishing, fishing communities in Northern Ireland. The fourth topic then is about um, representation uh, or oversight is maybe a better word, uh, wanting to, you know, the, where Article 12 of the protocol gives the Commission the right to oversee the way in which the um, protocol is being implemented. That's the, there's a, a a role there, um, given that uniquely uh, this will be the only place where the external boundary of, of the Union uh, will be being managed by a non-member state. Uh, so the, the, the responsibility for overseeing uh, the protection of the single market will lie with UK authorities, uh, and that, that will include, of course, DARA officials in relation to SBS, so it affects directly into the devolved space. But uh, Article 12 gives the Commission uh, a supervisory role there, and that, that's, it's working out exactly what does that mean. Uh, the uh, Commission are no longer pressing for a, a, a representational office in Belfast. What, what they're asking for is sufficient and proportionate oversight, uh, and there's still some, some way to go on, on that issue to, to get that resolved uh, in a way that is, is both sensitive to our situation here and with wording the protocol. So that, that's the, those are the, the topics under consideration. Uh, they're all in the, in the basket of, of work in progress. Uh, they all need to be resolved as quickly as possible because uh, the, the goal has to be clarity for businesses. So I think as was, was said uh, in one of the parliamentary <coughs> committees yesterday, uh, we, we're aware that there is a plan for further communication to businesses. It's uh, now um, probably next month, uh, early, early next month is the, is the uh, expected timetable for that uh, and certainly part of what we've been asking as officials consistently and what ministers have also been asking in their engagement with the UK government is to get to that clarity as soon as possible. I think the, the reality is that because there are some quite significant issues that need to be negotiated where there's, there's potential advantage to be secured, if we can persuade um, Brussels and, and the member states that, that there's, there's of some mitigate, mitigating measures. Uh, it's, it's some of the some delay may be worthwhile if we get a, if we get a better outcome. But getting a good outcome is, is the pr primary thing. It needs to be as soon as possible because time is so short and there's so much to be done. Uh, but getting there is is still a, a very very important set of steps. So that's that's the work on the protocol. Do you, do, I could cover more ground and go into the negotiations and other things like that, but is, is, would you rather I pause there and, and get into that topic? I, I'm, I'm well, maybe we give away. us all and then we can okay. question and, on all issues rather than, than going back and forward. Okay. Uh, so, uh, may I say a little bit then about the, the, the high level negotiations? Not, not, not that that's directly focused on 
uh, in Northern Ireland, but definitely some real significant issues that affect us. So yes. a little bit sure. about that and touch on preparedness, if, if that's the, 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 the would stop then, if that's okay. So on, on the mainstream negotiations, uh, you, you've, you'd have seen the um, regular readouts, including um, press conferences and press comment last Thursday from the latest engagement between um, Michelle Barney and David Frost. I uh, think the, the um, two areas where uh, it's publicly known that there have been progress and, and some degree of change of stance compared to the opening of the negotiations uh, way back several months ago would be um, the European side accepting and recognising that uh, the UK is not going to accept a deal that involves uh, a strong jurisdiction for the European Court in oversight. Uh, now, th th that's exactly what that means. Uh, we're not clear, and it's totally clear, but uh, a significant step that in, in recognising how that moves forward. In the other direction, uh, the initial positions of the two sides had been uh, that the EU was looking for a single association agreement, uh, so that everything, all the different dimensions, free trade, through to aviation, through to data adequacy, every aspect of the relationship between the UK and the EU would be under a single governance, overarching governance, whereas the UK's mandate or the approach document that they published in February talked about uh, an uh, ambitious free trade agreement as a freestanding agreement and then a whole range of sector-specific or topic-specific uh, separate agreements, uh, and the one of the one of the central points of that being that uh, you know the UK seeing itself as a fully independent state, uh, wanting not wanting uh, an, uh, an overarching agreement whereby uh, something some challenge in one area would be then then leading into or affecting the relationship on a, an unrelated area. So that was, that was part of the, the reason for, for wanting some of the agreements to be separated. I think what is emerging last week was the word that some acceptance that um, the EU's experience of dealing with Switzerland, uh, which, where, where, where there is this basket of quite complex agreements, that wasn't a good experience. I don't think it's a good experience for the Swiss any more than it is for the EU. I certainly uh, haven't been to very often on business, but, but uh, that, that picked up that. On one and on the one time I was ever um, talking to, to, to Swiss officials, um, but uh, so that, that that's a movement. I, I don't think it, I don't think it necessarily takes us into the full association agreement that the EU originally wanted, but it makes it maybe, maybe closer to that than originally in the UK's mandate. And that, those are um, on a glass half full. Those are signs of progress and signs that positions can change, and therefore. Uh, we should all look forward to, to further progress uh, in the further rounds. Uh, there's a further formal round in August and then more in September. So, so that's one way to look at it. Uh, there were also then plenty of signals last week which were rather more pessimistic on that front. Uh, I'm certainly not going to call it. I have I've no, uh, no magical insight into all of that. Uh, I think the, the, this, some of the key principles that are talked about are still very difficult. The two, the two <coughs> issues that keep getting mentioned as the most difficult would be fisheries and uh, the issue of, of level playing field, which in, uh, would certainly include issues of subsidy and state aid and, and all the, there's a lot of press coverage on that since the last round, um, but it's, it's the wider issue of um, the, the EU position being to say that a free trade agreement has to, has to not allow um, such regulatory divergence that, that the UK obtains unfair advantage and the, and the UK saying, well, you know, you, here, are, here are conditions you're seeking to impose on us which you did not impose on other partners in free trade agreements uh, such as Canada. So that, that's, that's the, the bones of the argument uh, and I think that's, that's got some way to go uh, before, before it draws towards a conclusion. Um, and would require some further political intervention. So that the, the relevance, the most relevant things for us in all of that context is uh, still that there be, in terms of the way the protocol would operate, significant advantage in there being a good agreement, and, and a free trade agreement, uh, the, the protocol will be 
quite complicated anyway. The at-risk goods concept I mentioned earlier will, will, will be of some relevance. If there are significant tariffs, especially on agri-food produce, then that becomes a lot more complicated. So highly advantageous from a, from a non island point of view for there to be a deal. Um, but, but that's that's and, and every every opportunity we take, it's, and our ministers take, is to say, don't forget these two things interact. There's a tendency in London to see these things as separate, and you've got a, a team working on the protocol here and a team working on the negotiations over here. And we're saying, make sure you're talking to each other and, and hearing what we're saying to both of you about the things that affect us. So that, that's that's quite an important dimension to the negotiations, as far as we're concerned. The same point applies in relation to agri-food. So, uh, if there was a, 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 an, a, an agreement, if, if a, an agreement on SPS standards and uh, agri-food regulation was part of a main deal, then again, that makes it easier to have relatively simple rel min minimum friction on the agri-food movement of goods from GB to NI. So that, that's they're, they're highly relevant. Data adequacy again, very very significant point for us given the, the integrated nature of some services functions across the island. There's a, there's a, a, a lot of issues where uh, a, a, an advanced deal has advantages in terms of the way that our economy would work, including the bits that are covered by the protocol, as in goods, agri agriculture, fisheries, and then services, which of course is not covered by the protocol. So all these things interacting together. And so that all that then, these, these are all the considerations that, that need to be managed as we're looking at um, readiness, and that implies both public sector readiness and business readiness. Uh, so an awful lot of work going on on that. Uh, the, that's something that's going to need further consideration at ministerial level in the um, in the weeks and months ahead. Obviously, a lot a lot that needs to be as clear as possible uh, by the end of September. So I think unless Lindsay or Lorraine want to add a pause there, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much indeed well, for um, that comprehensive um, update on the, um, the the meetings that have taken place. Um, I'll start off with a few questions, maybe just one on a very general um, basis, and I do think it, it, it sort of you've highlighted in a few instances that you know, especially some of the communiques that have been issued after the recent meetings, that um, they're do they do seem upbeat, uh, maybe in comparison to what it's been in the past, and I suppose maybe it's just to ask for your assessment of maybe the reasons for why it's upbeat or whether you feel that maybe the upbeat nature of the, the communiques maybe isn't reflective of what happened at the meetings. But I think I would be thinking that you're, you know, well, I'll let you answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that. <laughs> uh, I, I, it's very hard to call. It's very hard to tell. Uh, I think uh, you can interpret things. There, there's reasons. Uh, if, th if things were, were going particularly badly, there would still be a, a reason to, to speak optimistically publicly about it, uh, because there's a, a need to maintain a degree of confidence and momentum and, and hope. Uh, so you can read it either way. You know, it, that's, I'm not saying uh, anything about, about the merits of the issue there. It, it, could, it, could be, it could be, there could be areas where things are falling into place and potential landing zones or settling points are beginning to emerge. That, that you'd expect after all these months of, of, of engagement with mm. large teams talking to each other, not just talking past each other all the time, but, but understanding each other's points of view, that then you'd expect at least people to know what the options are. I think but no stronger than that, that by, by now they must know what could be done. And it then comes down to um, the, the art of the possible in the world of politics as to what, what combination of a potential given this, this you know a whole, whole range of, of different mm -hmm. streams these negotiations and you know, what what combination gets to something which can be um, accept is there something acceptable to both sides in that space Defin definitely possible uh, definitely an awful lot of work going on to, to try and make that possible um, I think just then it's listening very carefully to what people are saying are there real you know the red lines, and that's so the message getting across that when the UK says no court jurisdiction, you know that's that's not you know, a negotiation point. That, that's 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 an absolute. Uh, so that kind of thing, clarifying and landing is very very important. 
Yeah, so it's just worth saying that I think the reason for the optimism is that um, <clears throat> we've had quite a few rounds, and I'm sure you know you've you've heard here in the committee as well. Uh, there's been quite a few rounds where both sides have just set out their cases, you know, for for their own positions, and there hasn't been any real middle ground or movement or flexibility. And I think, as Andrea outlined, there's been a few areas where they've been able to find um, flexibility on both sides, or at least agree that they need to to look into those in more detail, as you mentioned, on the sort of the governance of the relationship and uh, some of the other things. And I think that great, creates optimism because it starts to see the way forward towards, as exactly as Andrew said, that sort of the, the landing the landing zone. I mean, there's obviously a bit of time pressure, as you know, and um, the UK government had certainly wanted to be a bit further forward at this stage than um, with, with having the outline. Um, uh, agreement, but they've now um, sort of accepted that they'll keep talking into September. And I think keeping talking is always positive, you know, and it means that they, they do see that there's there is a way forward. Um, but yes, there's still a long way to go. And the big issues, as Andrew said, are, are are the big issues have been there from the start, have been the big issues, and have been the issues we've known would be, you know, really sticking points on both sides. And both sides have very very clear red lines on on those. So. Um, it's it's still a way to go, uh, but but I think signs of of, uh, of some agreement is is positive, and that's the, certainly the reaction um, in Brussels as well. I think. The, um, I know that certainly um, again, and it's reiterated in the document, and, and you've made reference to the fact that you know at this stage definitely people are saying January the first is is the date, and there's not going to be any you know that, that that's when things are going to be be implemented, but. Do you, again, taking a higher level rather than very specific look at it, do you think we are ready for 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 the first of January, or do, you know, do you think that we've got the systems in place, or or do you think that no, we're not? Go you know, I mean, if if we're still negotiating, obviously some of the decisions that are taken in negotiations will have ramifications that may take time to implement. And and I mean, at what point do you feel? decisions need to be taken so that preparations can be made to be ready? Uh, some things would have been better to have decisions taken before now, mm -hmm. um, but, but uh, I think it's still possible to get to a place where clarity is resolved in time. I think it, it, it depends, I think a lot depends on even next month in September, uh, you know, because um, the, the uncertainty for businesses is pretty serious, especially given uh, the situation with the pandemic as well. That, 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 that is a pretty heavy set of, inf a very, very heavy set of issues for, for the economy. Um, so um, I think it's still possible to be organized and ready. We're certainly not, certainly not, not ready today because there are both uncertainties and things that need to be done in, in, the, in the practical implementation world. The large, large majority of those are not devolved uh, so um, the main topic that is devolved is the issue of agri-food checks, uh, GB to NI. That, that's the, the, the most difficult, sensitive, but very, very important area, which is, falls into, um, because the, you know, the way the, the, the statutory functions, the, they're, they're devolved statutory functions. So we're getting uh, significant assistance. So DEFRA are working very, very closely with DERA, providing a lot of technical support, advice uh, to facilitate that as best as possible. Uh, so so definitely lots of important work going on at the present time. Um, it, it'll, will everything be perfect at the 1st of January? I, I would doubt it will be perfect. Uh, the question is, can we get to something which is viable and workable and which then can, can settle uh, in, you know, into next year uh, as things adapt and settle into a new way of working? There'll be, Significant changes for a lot of businesses. Uh, the communication to businesses is definitely a deficiency there. Uh, the uh, UK government put out the border operating model in some detail on the um, the general interface between GB and the EU, um, but there's too many things that are not yet clear, uh, which will you know we see evidence of, of these things being worked on very hard. Uh, there's a lot of people working very hard on this. There's probably more, more people working on Northern Ireland issues within London than, than uh, many years, uh, because this is, you know, the, the protocol is central to the whole withdrawal agreement. 
so a, a lot of really important and good work going on, um, but it's got some way to go. And I think the um, right for our ministers and, and to continue to be asking you know, for urgent progress, uh, that's been a consistent and clear message uh, in, in engagements that, that we're having. And we're, we're reasonably well plugged into the um, Whitehall preparedness structures. Uh, you've got some good dialogue uh, with, uh, with specific to Northern Ireland. Then there's also work that is, is where we share interests with Scotland and Wales and the relationship with them, and then uh, some insight into what's going on at the highest level. So it's, 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 it's progress. Uh, uh, we'll know a lot better, I would have thought, by mid-September. If I could just maybe add something a little bit about the timelines just as well, mm -hmm. because obviously we've got yes. you know, two things happening in parallel, as you know, obviously. So there's the specialised committee and the joint committee and the decisions it makes that makes that, that Andrew has outlined. And just to say that, you know, the, the, the joint committee has to make its decision on those four issues before the end of the year, basically before the end of the transition period. So that's why, obviously, there's been a ramping up in those discussions and technical discussions between the UK and the EU on those at the moment so that the aim is then obviously to have a, a sort of stock take again in September when the next specialised committee and joint committee are supposed to meet and then with a view to them, you know, setting when they're going to make the decision or when they feel they'll be ready to make the decision in the joint committee. But in terms of the negotiations, the UK-EU future relationship negotiations, I mean, that is, as I said, said before, you know, the UK government had hoped it would have the outline of that agreement um, by July. That was its initial sort of ambition and uh, that sort of slightly delayed. But the, the EU is quite clear and that, you know, it needs to have that agreement, the sort of legal text agreed um, for October and really sort of the end of middle of October, uh, end of October, so that they can go through their ratification process to have um, it legally in place for the end of the year to, to start from the 1st of January. So, albeit, I mean, I think certainly us as civil servants would have liked lots of decisions a lot earlier in the process for our planning purposes. Um, but where we, where we are, we sort of have a sense that there are deadlines by which those decisions have to be made to give clarity. That doesn't mean that it's any less challenging to, to sort of do some of that, but it means that, you know, there are sort of deadlines there that, that are being worked to. It certainly sounds familiar, almost like Groundhog Day, that if you have a particular date that something needs to happen, that there's a lead-in period that kind of for the process before that. And I suppose maybe another question I had was really, I was going to sort of suggest around the customs element and again the information that was coming from the EU side it, it over and over again used you know that the, there was still lacking detail and time scales for the implementations of measures relating to and then it was customs and, and various things but it, it got, I got a sense from it that the EU feel that there's just a lack of detail coming from the UK side I mean is that being recognised and, and worked upon or um, is I mean is it a is it a set? I mean, you get frustration when you read something five or six times through the same paper that you know it's lacking detail, lacking detail, lacking detail. So, I mean, how much pressure has been brought to, to bear to actually come up with that detail? So, uh, there's a lot of very detailed work going on. I think, in fairness to, to uh, the cabinet office team and the departments that are working with them, uh, so I think there were uh, uh, over over a dozen meetings. On technical issues to do with the protocol last uh, what was it week before last and um, so there's a, a lot going on uh, the there are obligations on the European side as well of course um, in areas where uh, the UK want, wants to, to do things in a certain way and, th and therefore the, the the initiative lies with London to make a proposal there's also uh, an obligation in article 6 uh, of the protocol where both sides are required to use their best endeavours to deliver uh, an outcome which minimises friction in, in, in relation to Northern Ireland. That, that's in, in the section of the protocol predominantly dealing with NITGB, but actually it, it's, it's got a wider, wider application. Uh, so uh, there's, uh, the, the words are, are there and they were agreed in October and they're quite precise in terms of the scope and limits of what can be done there. But there's, a, a, there's an onus on all sides to work, uh, and certainly from executive point of view uh, and ministerial point of view, uh, the need to look for um, all sides to play their part in getting, uh, getting the best possible outcome. Uh, business community, as you know, have been very, very v vigorous in their activities. Uh, they've been 
lobbying, uh, expressing, uh, engaging very fully with the business engagement forum that the NIO launched following the command paper, but uh, they've not limited themselves to engaging through those opportunities created by UK government. They've also um, gone out of their way to influence Brussels as well and be, and be sent, trying to say to, to the task force in Brussels about the things that, that Northern Ireland businesses want. So, so uh, yes, uh, a, lot of, a lot of pressure, but I think genuinely a lot of, a lot of detailed work going on to, to uh, fulfil those requests. You know, the obligation is to get this resolved, and that, that can only happen through a detailed process. Okay, Doug, going to pass to yourself now. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. Um, Andrew Lindsay, thank you for... For, for your presentation. Uh, I mean, we're certainly in ground rush, that's for sure. Uh, as we come to the end of July, um, uh, uh, there's an awful lot of, of, of to do, and, and certainly business uh, does require uh, clarity. And, and you know, it's it's so complicated, uh, and such of the negotiations has been done at such a high level that that some of it is not getting the detail to us to know exactly what's going on. Um, but can I just ask maybe a, a, a couple of questions? And one's j just something I picked up on that you said, Andrew, if I can. And just uh, I'm, I'm looking at this as a glass half empty one as opposed to half full, so please bear with me. But you talked about subsidy state aid limits. Um, are, are we saying that this means that there could be a state aid limit for GB fisheries, which would be higher than a state aid limit for Northern Ireland fisheries because we're in that protocol with the EU? Um, if we have to abide by those, those is, you know, I'm getting back. Yes. Um. I, 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 I'm not an expert on this, and I, but I, I think, I mean, the, the state aid issue is really about, uh, it's more likely to be the same. You know, it's about how, it's the, the level playing field that, that um, it's sort of, the EU wants to have sort of assurances that, um, that, the, that the, EU, the UK wouldn't um, give a competitive advantage by changing the state aid rules that would be dramatically different from the EU rules. I think that's the but the is, he, but is it, but, yeah, but is the argument yeah okay so, so but, but is the argument is the argument that that the only thing that really affects as far as the protocol is concerned is, is Northern Ireland. So in essence they wouldn't be able to say to the rest of the United Kingdom that we want you to keep your state aid levels in line with our own. Well, I think that is actually the question. That is the yeah. issue that they're saying with regards to the UK-EU future relationship with the with the economic relationship and the free trade agreement, and the, that's the level playing field between the UK and the EU. The protocol sets out how state aid works in relation to Northern Ireland. Um, so, yes. so yes. which is basically mirrors what happens in the rest of the EU. So, uh, this is this is flow. It flows from. The raison d'etre of the protocol itself, which links to uh, the, the the fact that uh, there's goods goods and that will be in free circulation across the island. That's that's inherent in, in the outcome of the protocol. And so the, the measure in Article 10 of the protocol, state aid, is to uh, make sure that there's no unfair competition, an unfair advantage being taken in either direction as a consequence of unique arrangements that arise from the protocol um, so so that, that's if you like that is a fixed point in a situation where the, if there was no negotiated outcome then clearly uh, the UK would be at liberty to do whatever it likes in relation to GB and, and agriculture support now uh, the that's that's theoretical uh, in, in what they would actually do in the real world is probably much more likely to be con conventional but in the absence, if there's no free trade agreement, if there's no uh, future relationship agreement settled at the highest level, if we end up with an, a non-negotiated outcome, then there is, you know, more, more that, as, as Lindsay says, more, more that London could do in relation to subsidies. But that, that's, that's inherent in, in the um, nature of the relationship. And, and that's the worst case scenario, and that's the half half empty glass I'm talking about. And the the worst case scenario without a settlement in regards to, for example, fisheries, that that we could have a, a situation where GB subsidies could be could be higher than Northern Ireland subsidies. In, if, it, so, there's, if there's not a settled agreement at the end of the... I think the, the agriculture sector, I can remember way back uh, to 
some of the initial discussions after the referendum, and there was, I think, an awareness in the agri-food sector, and this would include, include fisheries, that, 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 that there was a, a risk that, that they end up uh, having a, a different, some different sets of pressures. One thing the protocol guarantees is, that, is the access of produce into the EU. Again, this, that, that because there's that free circulation, uh, in, so there's, there's a, a trade opportunity in that. Uh, the access to the GB market, so the, the commitments in the, in the white paper and in NPA and in the command paper are to unfettered access, but they I think the producers have been well aware that there was a potential of some pressure on them in terms of competition. So that, that's a, a genuine fact that is, is there. Yeah. And, we, and we won't know until all the negotiations settle, both the, the detail of how the protocol is applied and the um, um, wide, uh, wider FTA negotiations. But the, the line, you know, working very closely with London on this, on this topic to make sure that, that the, uh, we get the best possible outcome to this particular point. Uh, and, and as good a level of permitted uh, so, so it's just, going it's, forward. So it's, it's one of those frictions and pressures that, 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 yeah. that, that along with a hundred other things or two hundred other things needs to be needs to be uh, addressed. Where, where are we at the minute in regards to security and justice cooperation between in, in the negotiations? That's a, that's one of the one of the major desks in, in the in the one of the major work streams in the negotiations. And again, there, there'll be some changes in relation to the way that it works out because law enforcement will differ. Um, but certainly the UK is looking for the best possible access to ongoing cooperation. Uh, it's one where the Department of Justice here and the Home Office in London and, uh, and the Commission are, are involved in, in there's, there's a good awareness of what's going on. I, I don't have much detail on it, I'm afraid, but uh, I think it's, it's an area where um, there's quite a lot of common interest in making sure systems can work uh, after the end of the transition period. Do you, do, okay, so, so Andrew, do, you, do you think we're getting the level of detail that we need then in regards to this? Is, I mean, a lot of this is at the higher level negotiations, yes. UK level negotiations, but are we getting that trickle feed of information so we have that? DOJ, DOJ when I talk to them, they're they are well plugged in. I, 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 again, I don't have it myself, but I think justice officials here are w well, well um, th their access is pretty good. To the process in terms of understanding what's going on. Okay, and and just just a, just just a last one, just just to get your perspective on something, if I if I can. But you spoke about the UK wanting to have a whole lot of separate agreements, whereas the EU are looking at overarching agreement. Um, do, if if we approach, if we if we went through this with the, the UK system and had all of these small separate agreements, would that mean that post the 31st of January we could still be making small deals post that date? So we could have a we could have an agreement, but some of the smaller now you should that hasn't been sort of tied down. Those agreements can can take place post the thirty first of January. I'm not sure my ground on that, but I think I think that might be theoretically possible. Uh, so the, the, the so I mean the, the one that springs to mind is data adequacy, where uh, you know the, the, any third country can seek to have a data adequacy agreement with the EU, and so that the, the, in a way therefore that therefore the time for that negotiation isn't. Limited, isn't limited to a transition period in that sense. You know, you can you can have a country looking for that arrangement. So, I I, I, I think that if, if my primary logic is is correct there, then yes, there's a, at least some scope um, for timetables not to run. I think the economic interest remain, would remain to get all this sorted out as quickly as possible because you know I mentioned the other point about data adequacy is, is that. It's a, a, a very, very significant enabler of economic activity in the services sector, and therefore uh, it would be highly undesirable for that to drift any longer than it has to. But I think theoretically there probably is some scope for some aspects of negotiation to, to continue. Is that, is that yeah, I, I think uh, the, am I imprudent I, there? Yeah, you know? I think the, the main issue is that at the end of this year, the arrangements as they stand stop. Yes. So if there isn't something to replace them, they stop and you move to that third country status. And you know the Commission, and I'm sure I know you've discussed them here in the committee as well before the Commission has all of their readiness notices of how you deal with the United Kingdom as being a third country um, 
you know, to the EU after the 31st of December this year. So the point is, those arrangements will then stop. And that means that you would have to move to a certain regime as a third country. And yes, while you could take time to negotiate, as Andrew said, yeah. as you could at any third country, there is a gap in that provision. And therefore, you would have to sort of almost stop something, put in place a certain regime, and then negotiate a new regime and put that in place. So there's, there's, a, there's obviously an advantage to having it done by the end of the year so that one regime starts and another starts stops and one starts. I mean, obviously that's different for us because of the protocol which covers, which which enters into force, you know, sort of no matter what happens on the UK um, EU negotiations that, you know, that's our kind of baseline that we know we have from the 1st of January. So uh, that's where that's slightly different. But yes, um, I think that's the UK's, um, this is why there's been this difference of opinion between the UK and the EU and how to approach it, where the UK thought if it was in smaller bundles, you could maybe agree some of those things, you know, as quickly as you could and move on, where the EU wants it to be more of that broader agreement. And, you know, it's a sort of a negotiating tactic on both sides, let's say, as well, and how they approach it. So, um, but yes, you know, you could, yes, in theory, do it, but you agree some of those things later down the line. But you've, you've, you've gone, you will have had to put in place a certain third country regime if you haven't got it, uh, another agreement in place. Uh, so, uh, okay, so, so I'm sensing that absolutely the end of the year is a hard stop. You know, it's, it's, it's not a soft stop. Um, and that is if you've got an agreement which is 95% sorted come the end of the year, if it's even at 95% sorted, it hits a hard stop. But the point I'm making is, if it, is it a hard stop? If it's 90% sorted uh, and it takes a meeting in January, then actually it's a soft stop. You know, it's not a hard stop. You see the point I'm making? If you have an agreement on a particular issue which is 95% sorted and we get to the end of the year, does the hard stop kill it dead? Or is it a soft stop which allows that last five percent to be fixed after that date? That's the point I'm trying to guess. In, in, you, mean, to... you mean in one of the in, say one of the raft of, of yeah yeah uh, exactly yeah, yeah. negotiation? Um, I, I think what Lindsay said would still stand that, that there'd be a there'd be a regulatory gap yeah, yeah. in one sort or another. Uh, it, it, so it, it's. Um, Quite complicated. I think there are yeah, some things where you have a sort of, if it, and I'm not the expert on it either, but there are some things where you know you can, yeah, sort of have an interim arrangement. I mean, I think one of the ideas has always been to try and get the, the free trade agreement agreed, and you know that there's different processes from the EU to ratify that. But other free trade agreements like Canada, um, Japan, and others, they enter into force on sort of on a temporary basis in an interim. So certain provisions of it that the EU can approve, for example, would enter into force, and then the member states have a ratification process as well, so it enters into force slightly later. I think Canada, it's only recently with the 14th or 15th member state ratified that. So there are things like some of those arrangements, yes, can be maybe slightly less black and white in terms of how that works, but you would still need to have something in place. From the EU's point of view, let's just say they would have to have something in place and approved before the end of the year for it to sort of, even in an interim capacity to go into the next uh, year. But um, so, so it really depends on whether it's all in one bundle or these simplified uh, sort of smaller agreements. As Fascinating, as complicated. Said. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Chairs. I'm going to uh, move next to Martina, but just before I do, Pat, there was something you were indicating just on what Doug had said, maybe just uh, for a was, small was, point before we go into it. That was just on the issue of security, but I'm happy to wait and come back. Oh, okay. okay. So, Martina, we'll pass to yourself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you both for, for your presentation. And it's obvious that you're, you're well across it. And I appreciate the fact that we need to give hope uh, and optimism. But like many other members here, I'm dealing with the Chamber of Commerce in Derry, and they don't want teen sympathy. They want clarity. They want to be prepared. They want to know what they are facing in five short months. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the, the British government is, is, is prepared to throw the North out of a plane without a parachute as we head towards this cliff age in five months' time. And there's a few among many that Johnson and Frost and Cummins that they're playing around with the lives and the livelihoods of, of people in the North. Because people are aware now, even if they weren't before, 
that we are set to lose 3.5 billion of European funding. And whatever about the, uh, the level playing field with regards to the kind of potential funding that might come from the British government for farmers or fishers, fishermen and women, I don't believe that we're going to uh, get that amount of revenue from the British government to make up from the loss of European funding and 10% of the GDP. So to that end, and given the concern that uh, the business community have, what's your view of the comments that was made yesterday uh, in the House of Lords by um, the Minister Robin Walker? And I just don't know what planet he's on when he said that there would be no need for compensation for businesses in the North because businesses will be at a cost, uh, businesses won't be at a cost disadvantage here. You now businesses are running on empty because of COVID-19, but they very much uh, uh, understand what could be at stake at the end of the year if it goes over a cliff. But I'm concerned that that kind of mindset that thinks that businesses here don't need any kind of potential financial support as, we, as they learn to, um, if that is the case, to deal with the outcome of these negotiations, whatever they are. Would you agree with his assessment that, business do, uh, that businesses will not need that kind of compensation uh, or financial support? I think that, that will depend on how the negotiations that I talked about earlier, how those resolve themselves. I think there's, there's several, several different strands to what you've said there. Um, so there is the wider, in terms of, of um, European funding, there was the um, government commitment, to, commitment in relation to replacement of that funding and the way in which uh, future UK funding would replace some of that. So that, 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 that's, that's a... Do we commitment. have detail of that yet? Not, not, not yet. And it's only a promise. There's work to, work to be done on that. But uh, that's one where, again, um, there are undertakings given by uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, by, by the government, to, to replacement funding. That, and, and so the Department of Finance are well placed to engage with Treasury on that and hold, hold to those promises. Yeah, but they that, still that, haven't put any detail no, on I, that I, promise. Except that, that, except yeah. that but, but the, nevertheless, that the, the, the undertaking is there. In terms of, of the impact on businesses, the, the, uh, it depends on the extent of, 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 of pressure. So if, if, if some of the things that are proposed in the UK government command paper in relation to mitigation of the operation of the protocol are removed, then, uh, then the cost to business is, is re reduced. Uh, so... Therefore, if that is agreed by yes, the EU, yes, as opposed yes, to yes, command so paper, is only the British government's paper. That's right, an agreement with the EU. Uh, you can, you can you know, have your own view of the merits of, of the different aspects, but uh, they're, they're certainly asking for things that would reduce the, the bureaucracy, uh, avoid um, paper documents for customs declarations, uh, and streamline and minimise the checks on agri-food goods and so on. So all of those things are worth pursuing. I think there's still an argument that would say, uh, to the extent that there are unique costs hitting non Islanders or tra traders who are moving goods uh, in both directions across the Irish Sea, uh, to, to, to argue for some degree of compensation. I think that there's a, a, a rational argument that, that there that says, uh, you know, this is, uh, there aren't too many jurisdictions in the world where within a single jurisdiction there are these customs related or SPS check related obligations on because of different regulatory zones. <coughs> there, aren't, there aren't too many places where that arises in the world. And this, this is a unique arrangement. It actually was absolutely central to the uh, success, so to speak, of the negotiations in October. The fact that they got an outcome, with it, the, the uh, opportunity for that arose partly because an agreement was reached in relation to the protocol. So why should not so why should not Island businesses carry the price of that? Uh, the, the, what we don't know is, is what is that price because uh, if if the protocol is implemented in as soft way as possible and there's a good free trade agreement then um, you know, cost costs would be reduced. There still will be some uh, and we will also have 
parts of you know, some businesses across the water saying, um, you know, you're better off than we are because you as Northern Ireland businesses have access to the single market through uh, an open land border. So isn't that an advantage for you? So, so part, part of the argument you have to raise is what are the unique costs applying here that are the consequence of the protocol and can we have a, a precise and refined argument? So th that's definitely still to, be, to play for. Uh, it's got to be dealt with, again, this is for ministers to uh, consider precise tactics about that, what to argue for. It's a matter for finance minister, economy minister especially, to uh, to work on what, what exactly we're we asking for and then for first minister and deputy first minister to, to bring that through at an executive level. You know, what, what are they, what's our ask? Uh, it, it needs to be reasonable and credible, but w when, when we have things that are unique because of the operation of the protocol, there's an argument that's there. We don't, we don't know precisely what, it, what the outcome will be, but we should be arguing, on, first of all, on principle, uh, that uh, unique imposition of costs arising from this way of doing EU exit uh, should be borne in mind. Um, but uh, I think just, just to be wary of the, of the counter-argument from people across the water who say, well, you know, uh, there's, again, this will be partly coming from the Remainer lobby, saying, you know, this is bad for the economy, and the British government will be, will be saying, uh, you know, we are positive, the, 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 their view will be positive in terms of the, the, the whole nature of the policy. They'll uh, not want to be putting it forward as a crisis. So there's, there's a, a range of considerations there as to how you play the argument, but definitely some things that we need to fight for and, and push for. Well, given that 80 per cent of our SME trade trade on an all-Ireland basis, many of them are absolutely thankful that there's not going to be any hardening of the border partition in Ireland. And that said, they also operate some of them, or the larger businesses operate um, east-west and they want to ensure that, mm -hmm. yeah. that they don't face financial penalties. So someone needs to disabuse Robin Walker of uh, his view with regard to the implications it's going to have on businesses, because I can tell you, talking to businesses in Derry, and I'm sure it's the same across mm -hmm. the north, they are deeply worried and concerned, and they don't feel prepared, and they don't have the clarity, and certainly that's a view of the Chamber of Commerce. But when you talked about, um, you, when, when you mentioned about, for instance, um, maybe some impl the implementation of the protocol, you talked about that in the decisions. Has there been a stock take on the implementation of the protocol? I know you said that things are moving along, but has there been a stock, t stock take of that? And run in parallel with that, um, it would be the fuse perhaps of some ministers relating to what you said earlier that if some of them were arguing for a particular derogation from the protocol, then what is the view of the Commission in that? Because if you've been at both meetings uh, last week, you probably have got a handle, at least an insight into the window of their thinking with a potential derogation of the protocols if some ministers here or MLAs are harbouring notions that that could take place. So, um, in, in a sense, the specialised committee meeting was, a, was, a, was a, an overview, a stock take? Of progress, and uh, you know, you've seen the the way in which both sides expressed their their summary of that. There's a the, the, the there's no question that there's a lot more to be done in terms of resolution of the issues I talked about earlier. Getting those, those things into a place where, they, where they, they, there's a a pronouncement that says uh, after deliberation, the conclusion now is the following, and for that to be spelled out precisely and clearly to say you know when. You know, the category X of goods is presented. Here is exactly what needs to be done, and how that links into issues of, of customs declarations and agri-food checks for that very large and important subset of goods. So, so that, that's all going ahead. Um, I think the the um, signal is that uh, the um, th there's the obligation, as I mentioned earlier, on both sides to look for best endeavours to make it work as smoothly as possible. That's in Article 6 of the protocol. Uh, that's within the legislative framework. So you, know, you, you will know uh, better than any of us uh, uh, the nature of the legislative base that is, is what the EU is in a certain sense. Uh, you know, uh, it's a, a body of legislative provisions. And, and uh, so I think absolutely right that every effort is made in the present time to make use of every flexibility, every, every 
uh, every mitigation uh, that is possible within the acquis uh, and for that to be interpreted. Uh, you know, the, the SPS checks, are, they're, they're by definition about safety and uh, you know, not everything is checked. It isn't possible, it isn't physically possible. It wouldn't be, it would be ludicrous to have 100% physical checks of everything. That doesn't happen anywhere. Uh, New Zealand has, a, has an arrangement where the, the level of checking is is 2% of, of physical checks. So the, the the argument has to be, and this is a valid argument that is being made quite strongly by, by DERA, is to say let, let, the, let the level of checks be, be proportionate and, and advised by uh, the actual level of risk. And that's, that's there is, there is that's genuine not a scope. That, that's not a derogation. That, that's, a, that's potentially a mitigation or mm -hmm. a interpretation, uh, a flexible interpretation of the acquis. The acquis uh, will apply uh, and you know, I think this is where it's right, entirely right for the UK government and for DERA as a department to be arguing for everything that is possible. If things are uh, you know, at, the, at the margins of the rules or uh, you know, involve some creative interpretation, so looking at that Creatively, it wouldn't be possible for them to ask for derogation not, as not some people are changing, trying to. Yeah, not, they're trying not, to suggest changing the, changing rules the protocol. That, that's, that's not that's, going to happen. Uh, that, that, you know, that, that, that as, as you know, would require uh, council, commission, and, and parliamentary processes in Brussels. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, the, the, the rules aren't going to change. No. The, the, the absolute objective has to be to ensure, ensure that they're applied, interpreted, enforced in a way that is as smooth as possible and, and does the minimum. Possible um, causes the minimum, minimum possible friction, uh, and, and that's that's a, a very worthwhile journey uh, at the present time. And if, I think even to say that a little bit longer of delay, uh, everything you said, everything you said about businesses wanting clarity is absolutely true, and 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 we're way into overtime from where we should be in terms of giving clarity. But better to wait a little bit longer and get the best possible outcome. If, then, but we don't have the time to wait uh, longer. The clock is ticking and yes. it's ticking louder. And this is our last meeting um, now in July. There's going to be no meeting scheduled, at least for August. We'll be back in the middle of September. And they say by October, it's over. Because there are 27 other member states that yes. have to go through their own legislative process. So by that stage, we are weeks, if not then, days away. Yeah. So you can understand that the Chamber of Commerce in Derry and in Belfast and elsewhere are deeply concerned and worried. And then Probably when you so. pile on top of that the common framework, which we mentioned earlier. Now, the common framework would be the agreements, for instance, in this administration between the British government and, and the executive. And there's 151 of these common frameworks. Now, this, is, this committee was told that only 10 would be ready by the end of the year. So that leaves 141. The British government has already issued, produced seven reports on the progress, progress, question mark, that has been made. The last one now that I can see is around May 2020. And then they list sort of a number of phases that would have to, have to go through in order for these common frameworks. Now for some of that, for anyone listening to this, sounds jargon. It doesn't mean anything to people's lives. But when you try to unpack uh, in terms of what these common frameworks are, um, 63 of them around uh, transport, energy, environment and rights. Um, 78 of them, um, which was talked about around the, and I'm sure Pat will pick us up around the judiciary, uh, around the Home Office, health issues. And then you have 21 of them that needs legislation. So, and that's around agriculture. So, you know, when we look at these common frameworks and the fact that the British government has legislated that these are policy areas that are the competency of this administration, of departments within this administration, and the British government has told them that these areas will be frozen for two years and potential then only um, the legislative sort of run of these will be five years. So we're having a number of legislative areas that would be frozen, you know, water quality, air quality. Um, again, it's supposed to be the competency of this administration. Will they be transferred? 
will they be here? Agri-food around GMO food and pesticides. We all know that people have deep concerns about some pesticides in relation to some of them being carcinogenic, and there's a big debate about that. And then transport around roadworthiness test for motor vehicles. Now, this is at a time when we're coming out of trying to deal with COVID. There's 151 areas of competency that's the, uh, under the, uh, this assembly and this executive. And we're being told by the end of this, this year that only 10 of them will be ready for transfer. Now, that's, that's deeply concerning for all of us in this committee. And we need, we need to understand these common frameworks more. We need to know in areas, uh, each, each committee and each department as to the implications of those common frameworks. And it's clearly uh, of concern to us that by the end of this year, when perhaps we will go over a cliff or be thrown out of a, out of a plane without a helicopter, that we'll only have 10 of the areas that, you, that out of 151, that's the competency of this assembly, and the rest of them will be frozen in, and they will be in the hands of the British establishment. So where uh, are well, we with um, all of that? I think that? Lorraine is, is hopefully still connected and will be able to answer that, that fully. But in, in, in the, 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 this is all about the repatriation of areas which were previously legislated for at EU, EU level. But they're now they, in the they, they, they come back. Yeah. And, and I think that unlike the areas we've talked about in relation to the protocol, mm -hmm. the implementation of the Free, free Trade Agreement, uh, you know, these, these <coughs> don't automatically change as of 1st of January. So, so there, there's, there's a provision for continuity. So I, I think that the, there's less of a, a crisis about that. So I think there probably is, in, 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 in general terms, um, less time pressure on this area because uh, the, the question would, will be uh, what, does, what does the UK or what do the devolved administrations separately wish to do with the new the, the powers that... that, that are now you know, levers in relation to either regulation or oversight or intervention in the economy of, of various kinds. Uh, there's scope to act in a new way, which is no longer part of the EU. But uh, the, the actual imperative to act will, will be according to the routine processes of policy development in either at uh, four countries, four, the four parts together or the four parts separately. Or in some in some other some other combinations, because the scope of the devolution settlements varies considerably between Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. But Lorraine, uh, let, let, let you answer the, that more fully. Just wanted to. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Can you can Yes. Okay. Um, no, just to give you an update on on the frameworks. Yes, there were originally 157 uh, policy areas which were identified where the EU law intersects with the Northern Ireland Assembly. And we're now at a stage where just over 40 of those are considered to require a common framework, uh, with the remainder covered by existing interdepartmental agreements and working relationships. And there is a reprioritisation exercise that's done each year in looking at those uh, frameworks and then either moving them around in the categories um, when they look at the, um, the arrangements that are already in place. So yes, uh, you are correct in that uh, there are 10 frameworks which have now been identified as being priority and they sit mostly within the uh, agri-food space. So we have things like agricultural support and animal health and welfare, food labelling and compositional standards, for example. Of these, three frameworks are expected to be fully operational by the end of the year and these would be hazardous substances, nutrition and emissions trading scheme. The remaining seven of those priority ones um, will be moving into an outline framework, which would get provisional confirmation by JMCEN, um, and we're working towards that across the UK for that to happen from early 2021. Um, now, those provisional frameworks will be submitted to the, the relevant assembly committees for scrutiny, um, and those B exercises will be taken in conjunction with England, Scotland and Wales. The remainder of the frameworks are expected to move to an overarching agreement to govern relationships in those areas. So uh, there is a, a interim arrangements, really. We recognise the challenge of this project and there are interim arrangements being put in place which would get these frameworks to a particular stage, um, which then we would continue to work on into uh, next year. 
There is no, I mean, the, the government has committed not to make, to use any of the Section 12 powers within that. And that's really what we work towards across the, uh, across the UK. Now, an added complication to this, obviously, will be the internal market consultation document, which was uh, published just two weeks ago. And uh, the, the, the executive will be considering its response to that as well. Um, within that consultation document, it refers to the common frameworks. Um, and it, it does sort of make, really, when you look at it, the common frameworks identified early on in the project that the internal market was going to be an issue. And that's why it had sort of developed a separate work stream of its own. Um, so we do need to look at the interaction of these common market proposals with the protocol, but also look at the implications for the common frameworks uh, program and the powers returning to the Northern Ireland Executive, and that will probably also form part of the response that the Executive brings forward as well. I think in their document they set out that they felt that frameworks really were sector specific and you weren't looking at effects in other sectors, as i.e. I, I, the spillover effect and they didn't really address how the overall UK internal market would operate at the end of the transition period. So we'll be looking at all of that uh, as set out in the propo proposals and how we see the Frameworks programme has worked over the, the last three years. If uh, this committee had a document on this common framework, that if we were given information about what progress has been made, like for instance, I know that many of the universities would have hoped that uh, mutual recognition of qualification would have been a priority and one of those priority areas. And, and from what I'm hearing, that's, that's not the case of the three that you outlined in the 10 priorities. So can the Assembly be provided with, uh, with some kind of an explanatory note in relation to this? Can this committee uh, be, be uh, furnished with that kind of information? And uh, because it's another layer that is going to come at we, us from the just end. In a brief chat, there suggests maybe we might seek an oral briefing, briefing on that on, on that, on that, on that, on that one in that particular. Can, yeah. Um, and can can I ask? Um, did the can can the committee be given uh, some sense about the what work was done to replace the Peace Four program? Um, where that is at. Um, in terms of Peace Four funding, uh, and will the executive be involved in terms of the uh, control of this design and the allocation of the new Peace Four? So the, the, the new um, program is called Peace Plus. Peace Plus, and yeah. It brings together uh, elements that were in Peace Four and, and you know continuity from that, and elements that were previously in Interreg. De De Department of Finance is, is in the lead on that working very closely with uh, Deeper in Dublin and the SEAPB to develop proposals for the content of the new programme. Sorry, it's, and, it's, and it's, and it's not just that programme, it's not the actual Peace Plus, it's a replacement of Peace Plus. I mean, are, are we, yes, I mean, is, is that being worked on? And I know they, there's consultation going on about Peace Plus and the SEAPB is across that, but um, are we looking beyond that? that? that is the that is a replacement for, that is a sort of continuation of, so obviously the peace, current peace programme runs out at the end of this multi financial yeah, yeah. Fra framework. So the Peace Plus programme was proposed to replace it mm -hmm. and to bring in elements of the cross-border programme yeah. that the Interreg, inter I guess yeah. it's called, and the Peace Plus programme would run for the length of the next multi annual financial framework, which is from um, 2021. Um, actually, just last week, the European Council agreed the sort of preliminary agreements on the multi-annual financial framework on the, the figures, and um, in that there was a revision of 120 million for Peace Plus for Ireland. Um, the conversations that are ongoing at the moment are for the UK, because the, the agreement has been on Peace Plus that um, obviously the EU will put in money for Ireland as it, mm. you know, would do and um, the UK will pay money in for the Northern Ireland element. So there are still discussions and as Andrew said the Department of Finance are the lead on this but there are still discussions with the UK government um, on you know exactly what that contribution would be. I think that's uh, 120 like compared to previous contributions from the EU. I think it's slightly lost. more mm -hmm. for, for, from the so it really just depends on what the final more from the EU than previously. 
Uh, yes, to Ireland, to slightly Ireland, more. Yeah. Yes. Um, so um, I don't have the exact figures in front of me, so I don't want to say the wrong mm. thing. But I think um, you know it's slightly more as well than was proposed initially by the Commission. So in, in the course of the negotiations with um, between the member states, slightly more money has been given to Ireland for the Peace Plus program. And is this to be matched by the British government? Um, so. Uh, that is another discussion I think that's still to, on, to happen because, but I think it's estimated to be roughly the same proportions as exists in the current peace programme. And I think it would probably bring the amount of funding to roughly the same, maybe slightly more than the current peace programme. Um, but of course, bringing in the fact that brings in uh, the cross border element as well. So it's the negotiations, I think, you know, as you know, SUPB are working on the consultation. And I know there have been discussions, as Andrew said, with um, uh, sort of deeper and DOF on this and also with the Commission um, and um, of course participation in the programmes and some of the technical things around that is part of the EU. And is the executive involved in the design and the allocations? There's, I, there's been an executive discussion I think as well. Uh, there's, there's, to, be, to be some more, uh, it's still come back to, back to executive again but uh, no, the, the um, point that, that stands is that the um, establishment of the uh, North-South implementation bodies following the, the agreement mm -hmm. in 1998-99 in, in, you know, gives a statutory role to SEUPB uh, and NSMC in, in, in looking at, at this, this kind of programme. Uh, it was originally talked, that was in relation to these two. I'm so sorry how old I am now that I was involved in all of that way, <laughs> way back in, in, in those days. Uh, but uh, that, that's uh, clearly uh, a devolved and, and in fact, a north-south locus you know, to, to be agreed between the, uh, the two sides and the SMC. I think there's, the financing is still to, still being discussed between London and Brussels, uh, and uh, working out all of that. And there's also still question marks about the uh, what level of match funding from executive funds would be. So there's there's three bits. There's there's the European bit, and that applies to our side. There's the UK bit that goes into the pot, and then what's the intervention rate, uh, as, as you'll be familiar, in terms of uh, the, the, the rate of grant and then hence what has to come from executive funds. So all those things are being worked on, trying to get, again, the best possible like, the best possible continuity from um, all that. Yeah, it would be good to be kept but, across but, that but too. More that I think it's DOF's lead in area of expertise. Right. Um, moving on, it's absolutely not my intention to curtail, but to manage, because I'm conscious you have been here for an hour and a half at this stage, and we've still uh, more more speakers to speak than have spoken. So I, I, I don't want to, to try and take us, if we can, if we can, can keep our questions focused, and then we can move on. But I'll move next to Trevor. You always know, make that clear before you come to me. Yeah, it's not very clever. <laughs> Being the shortest speaker in the yeah. room. You always get to speak after Martina. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you fight that one out later. Right, well, uh, thanks for your presentations. Um, it, it, that was really interesting to hear the mm -hmm. level of detail and uh, what's happening or what's frankly not happening mm -hmm. in these discussions. But um, And also to hear some questions as well. You know, it, 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 I'm, I'm genuinely interested, but I'm pessimistic as well. Because this... This thing, it's not, it's not at the level of officialdom that it worries me. I think if this was left to the officials and the side, we would be a lot further on than what we are now. But we're not. I know you can, but we're, we're not, it's just a fact. It's, it's the political level that worries me. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just looking here at the, the report, the UK government report on the specialised committee meeting a couple of weeks ago. So what, what it actually says is you had a meeting. That's one paragraph. Uh, you discussed the preparatory work for future decisions. Second paragraph. Re the UK reiterated, reiterated their undying love for the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Um, and in both parties noted the intensification of technical discussions. And the UK noted its intention to provide further guidance to businesses in the coming weeks. That's it. That's what it says. What that indicates to me, I've said before, and I'll probably say it next week as well, that there's the level of commitment on the UK side compared to the level of commitment and ambition on the EU side terrifies me. I, think I can only see this, frankly, going one way. And the closer we get to the end of October, it seems to me 
the more likely it is that we'll, we're, we're just going to have to leave the EU without an agreement. It does, doesn't any longer seem possible to put all this together. And uh, I noticed, would bear with me while I change my page here. Yeah, at the bottom of page 28 in our papers here, um, this is a, this tactical note on the implementation of the protocol and next steps. The Commission expects the UK to provide the requested details and detailed timelines on the implementation measures to take as a matter of urgency. Last month, when we had the same discussion, the EU was stamping its feet as well. There was a particular Commissioner, if I just forget his name, began with this. Sarkovic. Yeah, and uh, he was clearly irritated by the lack of progress or commitment on the UK side. The uh, second line of that next step says the Commission expects the UK to enter into technical implementation discussions with the relevant Commission services immediately. Does that mean it hasn't happened so far? That there's been... <laughs> no, the the, the, uh, the um, dozen or so meetings that I mentioned happened at Hungary last were a range of meetings led by Cabinet of the Transition Task Force in London, but involving the uh, UK Task Force, that's the uh, Monsieur Barnier's mm -hmm. team, and exactly as, as you as you quoted there, the relevant Commission services. So uh, DG Sante, for example, who, who deal with agri-food and and that all that safe, uh, you know, safety issues in terms of, of health issues uh, with. Uh, DG Taxud to deal with, uh, with the issues on customs and revenue. Uh, so that, that, those technical discussions are happening. Uh, there's an in in intensity. There is an intensity of work going on between London and Brussels, and, and we've had a degree of insight into that and a, great, a degree of participation that is probably as good as we could have hoped for in that sense. So, so I think there's genuine commitment and genuine progress being made on the technical discussions on the protocol, uh, and, and those, those actually have to be resolved. The, the withdrawal agreement commits the UK uh, and the EU, both sides, to working together to get to joint committee decisions uh, on the, the four topics I mentioned specifically, that are provided for in the protocol, and the general approach to implementation where the UK wants to see things done a certain way. That, that could happen totally independently of what happens at the highest level between uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Barney and Mr. Frost. You know, th that, those talks could either be wonderfully successful and produce a, a very advanced FTA or lead to a non-negotiated outcome. In either of those scenarios, the protocol would still be up, applied and, and all the technical work on the protocol would still be done mm. and, and has to be worked out. So I, I'm, um, there's, there's, and that's where uh, we, we as officials and executive ministers are pushing as strongly as we can to, to, uh, to press for the things that are in uh, in this region's interests, so whether that's from economy department to Bayes or DERA, DEFRA, or Department of Justice to the Home Office, uh, Department for Infrastructure to Department of Transport, London, all, all these things are happening. There's, a, there's an awful lot of work going on across civil service, all, all of it, all of it, with some genuinely challenging political judgments to be made. So, so you know, uh, this need to set. Uh, you know, that, that there, there's there's a, a complexity to this politically in terms of judgments about what matters most, judgments about priorities, uh, judgments about what's acceptable, what what is consistent with um, the Good Friday Agreement, uh, and, and in all its dimensions. You know that that, that phrase is, is always added on. It's 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 got to protect uh, both. Uh, the north-south aspects and the east-west aspects, and the, 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 what the, I think the important phrase is probably the totality of relationships within these yeah. islands. Um, again, it shows my age in terms of remembering that phrase. But that, that, all of that, all these things need to be worked out, and, and there is a, a, an, off, an awful lot of genuine work going on at both political level and official level to, to make progress. It is challenging. There's no, no denying that, uh, and you know, it could yet end up in a whole range of different places, but. I think the important thing is, is for uh, all of us and for, for there to be you know, support to the, the ministerial team, and that's what we try to do as officials, is to make sure that the, the 
points are made as effectively as they can be in relation to our interests? I wouldn't doubt your your commitment to all this at all, that it shines through on everything you say. But uh, I still worry about the top level commitment. I worry about the UK who just, just appear to demonstrate disinterest, almost contemptuous disinterest at times, as opposed to the European, well, interest and frustration. The, uh, I, I really don't know where it's going. Just in one small point, you mentioned the, um, the fact that the EU has given ground, apparently, on the requirement for an office over here to oversee the, the customs arrangements and so on. Uh, at least that's a decision, <laughs> not, to, not to do something. Um, what, what, what form can your, could their representation take in terms of oversight and so on of the arrangements if they ever do come into place if they haven't got a base here? Well, uh, so the, the Article 12, I can't remember the precise wording of it, but it, it provides for supervision and, and there, there are a, a range of ways in which that could be done. Uh, it depends on uh, frequency, uh, you know, is that always pre-announced and pre-planned or what, what's the nature of it? But, you know, that, that, that's, it's, it's not, a, that's not a devolved responsibility. So it's not, it's not, we, we have no say uh, or really any influence on it. And of course, there are a range of different views on even the, back, back when the proposition was to have an office, there were a range of different views among the, the parties in the executive. That, that's just a, 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 a natural thing. It's, it's not, we've not been asked for a view as such. This will be worked out uh, between London and Brussels uh, and will be probably part of a package of, of outcomes. Again, it needs to happen soon, but that, that one at least is, it, you know, that doesn't affect business preparation quite so much, so it's, it's not quite so much on the critical path. Um, um. I think I'll just leave it at that because I'm going to bring the house down on my eternal pessimism here. I don't mean to, but really, it's it's. You're really, not alone. It couldn't be much worse than what it is. No, no. It's How long have we got to go? Two two months. The end of October, and and we're we're nowhere. We're nowhere. And nowhere, Cliff. Thank you very much, Chair. That's Bill Trevor. Like we've left you in an awful diner there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll speak to you after. Um, <laughs> Pat, to yourself. Thanks, uh, thanks to I'm seeing a few <laughs> nodding heads right now. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask some questions around the common framework, especially around uh, security and uh, police and justice cooperation and uh, health, particularly in the context of the current pandemic, about uh, uh, cooperation on public health issues. But since we're going to get a, a briefing on that at some time, and given the admonishment from the Chair, to be brief, I'll uh, defer on those issues. However, I did want to ask you if you could give us some sense of the amount of legislation that's going to come before the Assembly, uh, before the end of the transition period. Uh, so uh, there's a quite an extensive programme. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure Lorraine, Lorraine might have the figures in front of her uh, to, to, to give you, but there's uh, a number of primary bills that need to come through the Assembly. There's also some... Um, some primary legislation that has impact here that needs to go through Westminster as well. There's then a large number of uh, subordinate um, measures that need to be made, some of which at least, I think quite a significant proportion would be affirmative resolution and therefore requiring assembly time. Um, Lorraine, do you, have, do you have the figures in, in one of... Um, you put me on the spot there. If you keep talking for another minute, I might be able to find them for you. Uh, it, it, this, uh, it seems like a lot. It is a lot. Uh, if, you, if you want to leave that for a minute, yeah, we'll go back to, go back to it with the the note on it, even, even though with the handiest thing, because it, it is, it's, it's also a bit of a move, moving feast in that sometimes uh, a, a department can decide that uh, what was going to be two, two separate uh, instruments becomes can be rolled into one. So the, the number is the in a way it isn't actually the, the numbers that are one factor it's the degree of complexity mm -hmm. that matters as well mm -hmm. so that's all needs to be looked at so but it's it's a very significant program um and, and will need to be prioritized because we, we, we will need to have a functioning statute book as of first of january 21 that's that's essential uh, and so the areas that are certainly most affected would be economy and agriculture the, i think the two uh, departments that are, have the largest volume, again, that's partly because they're the ones dealing with 
um, issues that regulate the economy where, where things are changing because of the end of the transition period. Uh, so there's a lot to be done, for example, on the signal electricity market. Uh, again, that's the, the work on that is progressing very well. So good engagement between uh, DFE here, Bayes in London, and the Commission uh, on that. But it still needs done in terms of, of, of progressing um, primary and secondary legislation through Westminster and through um, through the Assembly. So again, probably probably best if we get get you get you a note. Can you send us a brief? Andrea, I can I can come in on that now if you're if you're happy enough. So um, in total, there are eight bills, eight with Westminster bills and three Assembly bills. And on the last monitoring round, um, it was 114 SIs and 77 SRs. Anyway, we're going to be okay. busy between. It's like yeah. January all over again. <laughs> yeah, so cancel a cancel a Christmas holidays. <laughs> anyway, um, thanks for that, Andrew. And and just finally, um, there's going to be a North South Ministerial Council meeting this Friday. Yes. Is Brexit going to be a priority issue at that, along with the implementation of the protocol and implications yes. for cross-border cooperation? I understand it. Yes. I think, so that. that I think, I think that's right, uh, and um, you know, obviously uh, it, is, it is technically called the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. That's the the, the heading on the document. Uh, so very important North South interests in that. Some aspects that that now, now there's a government in place in Dublin that, that there's some things that can progress that were probably on hold uh, in absence of that that for, for the last number of months. So lot, lots of work to be done. Uh, there, there are specific provisions in the protocol on North-South cooperation, on the role of NSMC and the implementation bodies. So that, that that's um, certainly there's, there's a, a, a programme of work that needs to be built up and developed. Uh, and we've had some, some good engagement with officials in Department of the Taoiseach and Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, and, and that's that's progressing well. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll go to uh, Starleaf now and start with Emma, who was on first. Emma, have you any questions you'd like to ask? You'll be relieved to hear that I don't. Uh, that was quite an exhaustive briefing and the questions uh, I think covered everything that I wanted to, to ask. Uh, I think everything that's been said today just reiterates um, the concerns that have already been outlined by Trevor and Martina and others in terms of we're, we're walking blind and there's cause to be concerned here and there's cause to be depressed. So that's my contribution. <laughs> George, George, do you have anything that you want to add? Just, George, be careful there with your microphone. Just remember to unmute that before starting. Switch the off button. That was your um, video that you switched off there, George. Maybe pop it back on and your uh, microphone and then we'll get to you. BBC one. <laughs> okay, I think we're having a. a I think he must have switched. I think he switched himself up. Easy done. Unfortunately, he's waited an hour and fifty minutes to ask his question. <laughs> okay. Well, if he pops back on by the time we uh, conclude, we, we, we'll, we'll draw him back in again. But um, um, we're we're unable to to help there. I'm afraid. So. Um, maybe just um, two or three things that just to, that, that have been mentioned during that um, that we're requesting a written briefing just on the Peace Plus program, um, and then we'll get an oral briefing on the common frameworks and just the the level of of work from there. Um, and if we could get those scheduled, um, that would be appreciated. So look, thank you very much. That's been nearly an hour and fifty minutes of a briefing there, and it's a very technical. A process and, and as I say I think it's it's clear members remain uh, concerned um, uh, but we don't underestimate in any shape or form the amount of work that is ahead for yourselves in the months uh, ahead and we wish you well with that and thank you for giving your time today and good to meet yourself and uh, we look forward to seeing you again you. soon and thank you to Lorraine who was on the phone as well okay thank, thank, you. thank you thank you thank you and we can just take a wee moment while we let you gather up there Thank you, take care. Okay. Take care. Where's your summer break?
He'll need it. <laughs> <laughs> if there is one. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, members, thank you very much. I thought that was, uh, was a good session in terms of getting lots of information um, from the guys, so thank you for that. Um, we'll move on then to item 6, which is SR 2020-135, the Salaries of Public Services Ombudsman. What page yet? Order Northern Ireland 2020. It's on page 84 of the meeting pack. Um, just to remind members that at the meeting that we had on the 1st of July, the committee agreed that it was content with a proposal by the Assembly Commissioner Commission to make a statutory rule to amend the salary payable to the Northern Ireland Service Ombudsman. The statutory rule was laid on the 9th of July and is subject to the negative resolution procedure. There have been no changes to the policy content since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Um, the examiner of statutory rules has not raised any issues with the technical elements of the statutory rules. So are members content with the statutory rule? Okay, content. not getting any discontent, so I'll take that as content. And therefore, um, I can put the question that the committee for the executive office considered SR 2020-135, the salaries, public services, ombudsman order, Northern Ireland 2020, and had no objections to the rule. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Okay. Members, item number seven is correspondence. There are 13 items of correspondence in the meeting pack. Um, there are none that I wish to take any members through, so are members content to note the items? No. Okay. Uh, item eight is chairman's business. Um, I'm no business from myself. Uh, item nine, any other business? Any other business that any members have? So can I just ask, and apologies if I've missed this from previous, did we not ask for a feedback on what the 2.5 million for the victims' payment scheme was going to be broken down? Have we had an answer back on that one? We haven't received a response. I think I perhaps sent that letter to both yourself and the chair um, in advance of the proposed meeting with the informal right. yeah. yeah. with yeah. the yeah. minister. Yeah. So that's why it's in your head. Um, we still haven't received that. Um, they had asked for a. Um, Extension to that one, I think it was. And we also asked, I think, for a copy or sight of the correspondence between the uh, Department of Justice and the Executive Office about yes. yeah. the lead department. We haven't got a, a response from that. At all. We haven't. No. Okay. No, no problem. Just yep. making sure. I have it's, still, it's still there. Waiting. It's still That's there. Okay. Yes, yeah. and we'll chase it up. All right. No, thank you. Okay. Uh, George, I see you're back, and I'm afraid that they have scarpered on you. They, they've disappeared there. So um, I'm sure if you want, uh, we can email in if there was a question. We can try and get the response for you there. Um, members, um, then we just maybe to reiterate the strategic preparation. What, what are we yeah, calling that? Strategic planning meeting. Strategic planning meeting. Thank yes. you to Sinn Féin members for the, yeah. giving us in your uh, procedures. I think you have mine. I have yours. Have we anybody else's beyond that? Nobody else's. Okay, okay. so we're not giving dirty looks to anybody, Trevor or oh, Doug God. or, or I, I, George, I, I, but we don't have those priorities. I have said that it just means that our first meeting will be longer um, because we'll have to go through that process. There was the, uh, you've been issued with the first day brief, which has the topics of areas. Let's call that a menu. All you have to do is make your three choices, your starter, your main course, and your dessert, and send that through to Marie. And then it means that we can have a certain amount of preparation done for our first meeting, which will be the date, time, and place of our next meeting, which is on Wednesday, the 9th of September at 2 p.m. So if we could get that detail from those members that haven't, it would be really appreciated. Um, I know that people are, whilst on recess, are not fully on a break because people will still be working in their constituencies, but I hope that members do get an opportunity for some time to recharge the batteries over August and uh, get some work out in the constituencies. And I look forward to seeing everybody in September. Okay. Sorry, Chair. Oh. Oh, oh, apologies. I'm throwing a uh, uh, cat among the pigeons here. Apologies. I'm in the constituency office and someone you just phoned me there about an issue and I missed a wee bit there see just in the correspondence I'm sorry you, you must have went through that agenda item and, and just in the length that I was on that call but I just had a, a wee thing that I was wondering if if we as a committee could write to the Equality Commission around just um, in relation to uh, the disability action plans they mentioned 
on, on the in the brief and pack and I can't look at it and my e pack at the same time. I, they just mentioned that there was 19 public sector bodies that they hadn't that didn't ha that hadn't produced um, plans that were required to and hadn't, and that they were going to engage further. Um, but I, ju I just wondered because I know that there have been concerns from within the disability sector around commissioners being selected from um, the disabled community, and I just wondered if we, as a committee, could could reach out to them to ask what actual steps are taken when engaging with public authorities around disability action plans and if, if this has been rectified because 19 out of 143 is quite a big percentage that haven't got that completed. Okay, and I think certainly could we ask them for, if they're not listed in that, if we could ask for the 19, 19. bodies that haven't produced those plans, that might encourage a little bit of mm. a bit of a nudge if they're being named and shamed almost. That, that, uh, but yes. maybe shame is the tough word maybe there are reasons but we could find out what the reasons are for that yeah. would that be possible right? we can write certainly yeah, yeah. okay okay well well caught oh. right at the end <laughs> that's fine Hello. okay members we'll conclude the meeting there thank you very much indeed thank you, thank you. okay thank you thank you this is the northern Ireland assembly committee room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.